Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's webinar. I'm Jennifer Mitchell, and I am the education coordinator that has been organizing all of these wonderful webinars. And today we have a fabulous introduction to wetlands, why we need to worry about wetlands from uh, Kim Ponzio here at the district. And um, I'll give you a little bit of background about her, but first I do want to go through a little bit of the housekeeping for this uh, presentation. Everyone that is joining us is on mute. Uh, we do hope that you will have questions, and as those questions come to you, feel free to enter them into the question box, but we will have a question and answer session at the very end of the presentation. Uh, we hope that you enjoy today. Uh, this is being recorded and will be available on our website, and uh, if you have further ideas about other um, presentations that you would like to hear more about or other topics um, that you would like to hear more about, please let me know. Throughout the presentation, we are going to turn off our webcams so that you don't have the distraction of seeing us, but we will come back on so that we can um, discuss those questions and answers at the very end. So Kim Ponzio has been at the district for over 35 years and has been doing a great job in uh, helping to um, delineate wetlands, to restore wetlands in the upper basin, and that is what her presentation is about today. So without further delay, we will start that um, presentation. Good morning, and thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction. Again, my name is Kim Ponzio, and I'm a longtime employee of 31 years for the Water Management District. And I'm also president of the Society of Wetland Scientists Professional Certification Program. And I'd like to talk to you today about my favorite topic, and that is wetlands. For today's presentation, I have several goals for us, and that is for us to explore what are wetlands, and what are their functions, and how do we value those functions. And then we'll focus on wetlands in the Upper St. Johns River Basin and take a look at how they've been impacted and how we've overcome obstacles in restoring and rehabilitating them. And, uh, you know, finally, we'll have a report card of sorts on how the wetlands are doing now and how you can get involved. And summing it all up, we should be able to answer the question of why worry about wetlands. So before we jump right in, let's talk about what a wetland is exactly. And this could be a refresher for some of you, but for those of you who aren't as familiar with these ecosystems, let's just talk about what we mean when we say something is a wetland. And I like to use the three H's to remember the major characteristics of a wetland. So what's the first thing you might imagine, and you can see in this picture of a wetland, is one of the main things or characteristics about a wetland. It, it is that it must be wet or have the proper hydrology. So you might say that water must be present in order for something to be a wetland. So let's go ahead and launch our first poll and see what the audience thinks about the hydrologic regime and how wet our wetland could or should be. So the question is, is what part of the year must an area be inundated or flooded to be considered a wetland? Is it 100% of the time, uh, 75, 50, 25% of the time, or maybe none of the time? So we'll give you a few seconds to go ahead and answer that. We'll leave this poll up for just a couple of seconds so that everybody can answer. Those results are flooding in. I'll leave it up for three more seconds. So three, two, one. Let's see what those results say. So let's see what the response is, what, uh, what we can find out further about that. Well, I have good news for all of you. You are all correct. Some wetlands can be flooded 100% of the time with surface water, and as long as it's not too deep, wetland plants can survive there. 
and some wetlands can appear dry and water is supplied through seepage from the groundwater and it can still be a wetland. So how can we tell if it's a wetland if water isn't present at the time when we're there? Well, we can tell if it's a wetland by the types of plants that grow there. For instance, in these photos, you can't see standing water in the swamp. But if you look at the trees, you know that this type of a tree, which is a cypress tree, is adapted to growing in wet conditions. And we call these plants hydrophytes, meaning water-loving plants. Now, hydrophytes don't really love that much water, but they are able to tolerate it a lot better than the upland or terrestrial plants. And so there's two lines of evidence of whether or not you're in a wetland, hydrology and hydrophytes. And you may also notice that uh, there's on this uh, base of the cypress tree, there's a good indication, uh, there's a little water line there, and that's a good indication of previous and sustained flooding. But what if there is no standing water or hydrophytes like big trees, and the area has been denuded of vegetation? How then will we know if we were in a wetland? Well, even if the plants aren't there, the soil is present, and it's like the history book or the diary of the site. So when water is present long enough, it makes the soils anaerobic or without oxygen, and the dead plant parts don't decompose well, and it creates a hydric soil that persists even long after an area has been drained. So now that you know what a wetland is, let's talk about what wetlands do for us. The value of nature to people has long been recognized, but in recent years, the concept of ecosystem services has been developed to describe these various benefits. And an ecosystem service is any positive benefit that ecosystems like wetlands provide to people. And I particularly like this graphic about ecosystem services because it incorporates the human element and shows that not only do ecosystems like wetlands provide services to us, but we as humans reciprocate and provide services to ecosystems. One of the ecosystem services that wetlands provide is flood abatement or flood regulation, like we see is needed here in these cities and neighborhoods. The district addresses this problem and prioritizes the acquisition of floodplain to preserve these natural areas that store floodwaters during extreme events. For instance, the Seminole Ranch Conservation Area which is nearly 30,000 acres in size, can store over 120,000 acre feet of water without pumps, levees, or other infrastructure. So working together with a series of flood control structures, wetlands store floodwaters and reduce flooding in cities and towns and rural, rural areas, releasing them slowly downstream. They also store water and act as water supply to be used later during seasons of drought. And on the right side of your screen, you can see an actual image of the St. John's River north of Lake Poinsett in Brevard County. And this shows it during a normal water level condition that you might see in most years. Since the river channel is difficult to discern, I drew um, a blue line to kind of keep your eye focused there. So keep your eye on the river channel. And I'm going to show you an image from August 2015 when we had record rainfall in that area. And those dark areas that you see is the floodwaters that are being stored in that area. And that's storing millions of gallons of water that would otherwise be flooding towns and cities. Wetlands also work to clean water by settling out sediments and particles in the water, sucking up the nutrients for plant growth and capturing heavy metals and sequestering carbon in the soil. They basically act as our kidneys do for the human body to clean impurities and filter the water. This will not surprise you that wetlands provide habitat for a variety of plants and animals, several of which are threatened and endangered, such as the snail kite you see in the upper right hand photo. Wetlands also contribute greatly to global biodiversity. Another ecosystem service that wetlands offer is climate mitigation or regulation. And they do this by capturing and storing carbon. In fact, even though wetlands only cover five to 8% of the global land surface, they disproportionately capture 20 to 30% of the world's soil carbon. And most undisturbed and well-functioning wetlands also reduce greenhouse gases, acting as a sink rather than a source for carbon. And wetlands act as an air conditioning system for nearby urban areas, buffering impacts of rising temperatures. 
Wetlands also provide us with endless opportunities for recreation and ecotourism, such as fishing, hunting, boating, hiking, bird watching, and many more activities. These seem to be the ecosystem services of wetlands that most people can relate to and are the ones you are most likely to have experienced firsthand, unlike carbon storage and climate regulation. And these are the tangible things that we can see or do, but there is something else that wetlands do for us, and that is provide intangibles that we really can't see, feel, or hear, but we can feel the effects all the same. And I'm calling these services human well-being, which includes things like a religious or spiritual connection, including indigenous tribes and their rituals and cultural practices, Wetlands offer one of the most exciting and experiential classrooms for educating future generations. They offered unparalleled aesthetics and beauty, and wetlands improve our mental health from a connection with nature and gives us what is called a sense of place. And it ultimately connects us to something that is bigger than just ourselves. And just in case you're not as convinced how important wetland ecosystems are, I'm gonna show you the money and this is a list of some of the major ecosystems that contribute to the global economy from Costanza's seminal study in 1997. And if your eye goes to the total value column, you might notice that, that freshwater wetlands contribute an average value of services more than cropland and grassland, lakes and rivers, but far less than the coastal ocean and open ocean. However, if you realize that the ocean is so vast, it takes a really large area to make that contribution. And if you consider that the area that freshwater wetlands cover, cover is smaller, you can see that freshwater wetlands per area blow the rest of the ecosystems out of the water by contributing two times more than any other ecosystem on this chart at nearly $2 million per square kilometer per year. Additionally, wetlands are doing more than their part to meet the four core missions of the district simultaneously by providing flood protection, water supply, water quality improvement, and natural systems as habitat for plants, animals, and humans. So now that you know what wetlands are and what they do for us, let's talk about what the headwater wetlands are uh, of our namesake river, and that is the St. Johns River, which is Florida's longest and only north flowing river. It begins its 300 mile journey from a drainage basin starting in East Central Florida and eventually dumps into the Atlantic Ocean in Jacksonville, Florida. And if we zoom in closer, we can see the headwaters of the river located in what is known as the Upper St. Johns River Basin, shaded in orange on this map, which encompasses nearly a million acres, 300,000 of which are owned and managed by the Water Management District. The headwater marshes are gently sloping and they don't actually form or develop into a divined, defined river channel until 30 miles downstream. The upper basin has been long recognized as a rich and important natural resource and a hot spot for biodiversity. And that really extends from the array of habitat types across the landscape from upland pinelands and dry prairie to wetlands such as floodplain marsh and hardwood swamp to shallow lakes. And these wetlands are visually similar to the Florida Everglades, and they are underlain by deep organic peat soils that developed over thousands of years. And of the 13 major habitat types, the most abundant in the upper basin is floodplain marsh, which is considered imperiled on a statewide basis and rare on a global basis. So what happened to the wetlands in the upper basin in the past? Well, beginning in the early 1900s, the historic floodplain suffered extensive alterations and there was a drastic loss of wetland. You can see on this map by the early 1970s depicted in the pink color, 62% of the 100 year floodplain had been diked, drained and converted to agriculture. This is on par with wetlands globally as the Ram Ramsar Convention documented that the global extent of wetlands is now estimated to have declined between 64 to 71% in the 20th century, and is still continuing to this day, especially in developing countries in Asia and South America. Upper basin wetlands have been impacted by ag and urban development. Loss of wetlands have occurred due to changes in hydro patterns that change the delivery of water to these ecosystems. 
They've been impacted by changes in fire regimes due to the fragmentation of the landscape. Nutrient enrichment from a number of sources. Colonization of exotic and invasive plant species. And finally, more recently, wetlands in the upper basin are being affected by the impacts of climate change with changing water availability, weather patterns, and species distributions. And now you realize that with that loss in wetland acreage, we also lost all those valuable ecosystem services. So responding to the negative impacts that development had on the upper basin, the district and all of its many partners decided to restore or rehabilitate the floodplain of the upper basin starting in 1977, when we embarked on one of the biggest restoration projects in the nation. And if we revisit that map I showed you earlier of wetland loss, you can see that due to the district purchasing and restoring former floodplain wetlands starting in the mid 1980s, in 2003, you can see in the green shading that a large portion of the impacted floodplain was reclaimed and restored. And I'm gonna show you another graphic this one shows a bit more recent in 2007, where the district has in partnership restored over 70,000 acres of wetlands. Now that we know why the district started to restore the wetlands in the upper basin, let's talk about how we did this and what some of the challenges and solutions were. This is a map of all 18 of our separate project areas in the upper basin in the color shaded areas. And I wanna show another map that indicates the wetland restoration areas in red. There are 11 restoration areas in the upper basin, ranging in size from 200 acres to over 14,000 acres, some of which are already completed in as early as 1991 and some that are still in progress. So how do we restore these areas and get from cattle pasture to functioning wetlands? Well, from our conversation earlier, you may know that the most important component of restoring a wetland is bringing back the water. Without the proper hydrology, we can't restore the hydrophytes and build the house for the animals. So getting this hydrology right is a paramount concern as the driver of all functions in these wetlands. So to walk you through the process of restoration, I'm gonna use one of our larger restoration areas known as the Moccasin Island area to show you the, picture, uh, the procedures sorry, that we generally use to restore these former floodplain wetlands. And this project area was converted to cattle pasture in the late 1960s. The effort to restore wetlands here was a joint project between the district and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And this was initiated in 1999 and cost $1.3 million. And we're gonna discuss the restoration in one of the more severely impacted parcels. It's the Northern parcel of Moccasin Island. The objectives of the Moccasin Island restoration were to reestablish the natural hydrologic regime, encourage colonization and establishment of native wetland plants or hydrophytes, enhance habitat for wading birds and other wetland dependent wildlife, and improve water quality to meet background levels in the receiving unimpacted marshes. We took a three-phased approach to restoration to reach these objectives. So phase one involved the removal of the agricultural infrastructure and remediation of any contamination from past agricultural practices. So we de decommissioned numerous free-flowing wells, removed fences and culverts, backfilled major internal canals, and, replaced, and we also placed strategic breaches and breaks in, in, in the internal levees to allow for the free exchange of water inside the property and then also to set us up for being able to manipulate the water levels needed for phase two. Phase two involved reflooding and maintenance of shallow water levels, not deep and not too dry, to encourage growth of wetland plants from the remnant seed bank in the soil. And wetland plants colonize, recolonize the site and plant species typical of improved pasture like you see here in this picture were gradually replaced by wetland species such as pickerel weed, smart weed, and sand cordgrass. During phase two, we also planted six native species on a total of 55 acres, which included sawgrass and spike rush. And here you see us planting sawgrass with a modified tree planter and spike rush that was installed as bare root seedlings. And if you look at the dates on the photograph, you can see that we had success 
in the planting just about a year afterwards. To enhance landscape diversity of the area, we also created a forested island, which was expected to enhance habitat for wading and passerine birds, as well as alligators and turtles. And this island was constructed from a levee remnant in the uh, past agricultural operation, and it was surrounded by a moat of deeper water on all sides to protect bird nests from land-based predators. And altogether, we planted 400 trees of 15 native species, and we constructed four artificial snags to encourage bird perching and deposition of seeds to enhance plant diversity on the island. Also in phase two, we monitored water quality to assess whether the water was clean enough, meaning it had low enough nutrients, especially phosphorus, to reconnect the restoration area to the adjacent marsh. And we saw water quality improvement with a decreasing trend in total phosphorus as evident by that straight black line on the graph. And by 2009, total phosphorus inside Moccasin Island declined to a concentration at or below the goal of 0.09 milligrams per liter, which was the benchmark to meet to reconnect this site with the unimpact, unimpacted floodplain. The implementation of phase three or the final phase was hydrologic reconnection, which we did by simply pushing the elevated levee back into the adjacent canal to restore a more natural hydrologic regime on the property and to reestablish that connection with the outside floodplain. This shows you an aerial view of Moccasin Island in the process of levee dem demolition in April of 2009 in that red box. And I want you to notice the river channel on the left and the deep water area inside Moccasin Island known as Mud Lake. This image is looking east at the same area and notice there's Mud Lake for your frame of reference. And if you look into the red box, you can see that there really wasn't enough fill material to completely fill that main canal. So we placed a number of plugs in the canal to restrict flow and push the water out onto the floodplain so that it can function naturally. And this is what the Moccasin Island area looked like just four months after hydrologic reconnection. And here's a chronology of what Moccasin Island looked like before the wetlands were converted in the 1940s, the pasture before restoration in the year 2000, and then after restoration in 2009. And take note that the complete restoration of this area, all three phases, was accomplished in 10 years after starting the project. But now Moccasin Island has become an integral part of the Upper St. Johns River floodplain. And as a result of the restoration, wildlife has become more diverse and abundant. And these are all photos taken from our restoration area. There's a bald eagle on the artificial snag we constructed on the island. American white pelicans used the area in the early stages of restoration when there was abundant open water. And the Florida sandhill crane was nesting in the spike grass just a year or so after planting. And just take a look at all the alligators surrounding the habitat island we created. I counted no less than 25 alligators that day. Since many of our restoration areas have different land use histories, there were different challenges for restoration of the wetlands in each of those areas. And I'm gonna give you a quick example of the four challenges I've listed here. Because many of the areas that we're restoring have deep organic soils, their exposure to oxygen and compaction during farming practices may have caused the elevation of the area to be significantly lower than originally. So those areas are restored to deep water habitat like Kenansville Lake that you see here. In the 1984 image, this area was being cultivated for row crops. Because of land subsidence up to about seven feet, it was deeply flooded in 2004. And by 2018, you can see that approximately a quarter of the area was restored to littoral wetlands along the western edge of Kenansville Lake. And this area has become a top bass fishing spot in the state. Sometimes past agricultural practices can leave legacy contamination that must be remediated um, on our restoration pro properties. We must water, monitor water quality and pesticide levels in some organisms like apple snails and fish that are prey for birds and other species higher on the food chain. 
And we only flood and make these habitats accessible to wildlife after demonstrating levels are appropriate as to not negatively affect wildlife. And then we continue to monitor contamination for a number of years to ensure the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that these areas are safe for wildlife. Invasive species such as old pasture grass species like torpedo grass and para grass can colonize disturbed areas and early in the restoration and dominate those plant communities. And this precludes native species that we'd like to see restored to the area. So here we use a number of tools like mechanical and chemical control and fire to manage these species and hopefully making way for native species to come in. Here you can see a section of the Felsmere water management area that has been dominated by the exotic invasive grass para grass. And we are still in the process of process of restoring native species to these areas using chemical control and prescription burns. And finally, this is a really good problem to have, and it involves threatened and endangered species coming into our newly restored areas. Even though that's precisely why we restored the habitat in the first place, we, we do have to make sure that we don't negatively impact these species while we're completing the restoration. And sometimes this can change our original goals for any one area and its management, like the endangered snail kite did for the Blue Cypress water management area. While we've realized similar positive benefits and results in other wetland restoration areas in the upper basin, and we're really getting notice for the work we've accomplished with our many partners. In 2019, the Association of State Wetland Managers published the Healthy Wetlands, Healthy Watersheds report and they highlighted the Upper Basin Project, was, which was only one of 14 watershed case studies in the entire nation, and the only one in Florida that was highlighted in this report. And as you look at this list, you won't be surprised to see many of those ecosystem services of wetlands that we talked about earlier. And I did just wanna highlight again that floodplain wetlands are helping the district to meet all four of its core missions simultaneously, flood control, water supply, water quality improvement, and natural system benefits. The Upper Basin is also receiving accolades from organizations from around the world and from various stakeholders. We were designated an American Heritage River in 1998, only one of 14 rivers in the entire US. In 2008, we were awarded the Australian Teese International River Prize, which came with a large check of 350,000 Australian dollars. In 2016, we were lauded as the project of the century for, by Florida Engineering Society. And also we were characterized by the Citrus, the Indian River Citrus League as a game changer for citrus growers, mainly because of the availability of water for irrigation and freeze protection. And then 2018, both the Florida Fish Wildlife Conservation Commission and the Bass Angler Sportsman Society touted the Stick Marsh and Keenansville Lake as one of the top bass fishing lakes in the state in the southern United States. So I hope we've answered the question, why worry about wetlands? And that I've inspired you to protect wetlands and all their many ecosystem services that they provide to us. Well, take a look at this list for a number of ways that you can show the love to wetlands. And I'd be happy to discuss any of these ideas during our Q&A session. But first, I'd like to share a quote from Baba Diem. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will only love what we understand, and we will only understand what we are taught. We are so taught. let's love our wetlands so by learning about, about them. By learning. So we are all ready for questions. If anyone has some, I see a few of them coming in right now. So please. Uh, enter those questions. One question, Kim, that, that we have is, um, you mentioned the importance of seed banks. Can you talk a little bit about that seed bank and what it is and um, the importance of, of utilizing that for a restoration project? Sure, great, that's a great question. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, well, the seed bank is something that is in the soil. There are seeds that are deposited from when it was a floodplain wetland before it was diked and drained. And many uh, of the species that are in the seed bank, they can, they, their seeds can survive. There are quite a few seeds that cannot survive in the seed bank for a very long time. We've actually found uh, seeds of water lilies that have 
lasted for a hundred years. So it's a it's basically a bank of seeds that that uh, has wetland seeds in it that can um, revegetate the areas. But a lot of times, like I said, not all of the plants that you'd want, maybe particularly like sawgrass, which was the dominant in these floodplain wetlands prior to to cultivation and development those are do not do well in the seed bank at all and they may have to be installed and that was one of the reasons that was one of the plants that we planted in the moccasin island area so uh, even adding water is that's great and sometimes you can get some things back but then also you can get some of those exotic species that are earlier to the scene uh, that outcompete the native dominance oh wonderful um, how would you, so another question that came in was, how would you rate the Lake Woodruff Wildlife Refuge wetlands um, in which this um, person often walks? Are you familiar with those wetlands? Okay, well, I will tell you that I, I have just recently gone to those wetlands this past year in January, my first trip there. And um, I've just been around the forested wetlands near the uh, Camp Lenoche where we um, had a meeting there. So I'm not that familiar with the Lake Woodruff uh, wetlands, but um, I did hear from some of the folks there saying that there's been some uh, changes in the nutrient inputs to the lake from surrounding areas. And that may be changing the plant community with a uh, invasion of cattail and some more nutrient loving species in that area. So other than that, I cannot give you any other answers about whether or not that those plant communities are, um, you know, what the quality of them are at this point in time. Absolutely, that makes sense. Uh, how, or the next question was, was the modification of the Upper St. John's Basin a part of the larger effort to drain and modify the Everglades? At first it was, we were actually part of the central and southern flood control district before the districts were um, uh, formed along hydrologic boundaries. So yes, we, we actually are in some places, the upper basin is considered part of that watershed of the Everglades. However, again, we were, the districts as well, were on these hydrologic lines. So that was the divide there. So if a water droplet hit, on one side of it, it would either go to South Florida towards the Everglades or it would go towards, you know, the upper basin. Now, again, I said that the, this is, these are riverine floodplain wetlands, but that, that floodplain channel, the, sorry, the river channel doesn't actually start until quite some ways down, downstream. So the headwater wetlands look very, very much like the Everglades wetlands. Uh, as far as having deep organic soils, sawgrass being the, the native dominant, uh, with dotted with mosaic of tree islands and things like that. So um, in, in some of the funding too, we are still considered to be a uh, part of the Everglades area. But as far as drainage, um, the drainage that happened in Everglades was draining it all to tide. That didn't happen in the upper basin. Most of our development was by agricultural interests around the basin, the headwater wetlands. Okay. Well, Although we do have, I, I have to say, we do have C54 Canal, which does drain to the river, river lagoon, and we're doing a lot of projects to make sure that the water that that, that went to the upper basin uh, stays and goes back to the upper basin, and we protect the Indian River Lagoon from uh, reducing freshwater discharges that are over and above what it would normally or naturally receive. All right. Well. Thank you. That's great. So I, I do see that there are a few more questions coming in. I do want to honor everybody's time. And um, so we will answer those in email to you. Um, so if you do have any last minute questions, please feel free to enter those. I do want to close with one last poll. Uh, so we're going to put up one last poll about your favorite way um, to enjoy wetlands. So how many of you get out and enjoy wetlands? Um, what recreational opportunity do you enjoy most in wetlands? Is it fishing, hunting, kayaking and canoeing, bird watching, or hiking and biking? And you can collect or you can select multiple of these options uh, if you are interested. So we'll allow everybody to vote for just a few moments. While you're doing that, I want to make sure to just thank you, Jennifer, for asking me to uh, make this presentation and thank the audience, too. And I hope they'll take a look at that list 
of things of ways that they, they can get involved. And I'd be happy to uh, have people email me if there's uh, something else that they would like to know about the restoration of upper basin wetlands. Absolutely. Wow. So it, we have a it lot looks of like hiking, hiking, hiking is, <laughs> is the favorite and bird watching a close second. So Kim, I do want to thank you. Uh, your contact information is up. So if others are interested in finding out more about the restoration projects, and thank you so much for this fabulous uh, introduction to wetlands, their importance, and then the restoration of the upper basin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy to do it. Stay well, everyone. Have a great afternoon, everyone.